Hi, I'm Mike Scott. Thank you for joining me for this fourth Zoom talk and question and answer in the current Christian Shakespeare question mark series sponsored by Georgetown University, Washington DC in association with Las Casas Institute for Human Dignity at Blackfriars Hall at the University of Oxford. You are one of a record 179 participants registered to join us for today's session, which will feature a talk for approximately 20 minutes by John Drakakis from the University of Stirling in Scotland, who will be speaking on putting religion to the question, political theology in Shakespeare's second tetralogy and his Venetian plays. This will be followed by approximately 30 minutes for question and answers. From the moment John begins his talk, you will be able to, by using your Q&A key at the bottom of your screen, type up any questions you have as we go along. I urge you please to do so. These will be fed to me and I will put as many of them as time permits uh, for John to answer. If your question is not answered in this session, John will receive it and hopefully will be able to answer you later by email. Today is the 13th and final talk in the current, current Shakespeare question mark series. The earlier talks are available on YouTube, whilst the Zoom talks are available on the Georgetown University website. We are in advanced discussion with the university press to publish a book of the talks in due course. The series looks at the influence of the Elizabethan and Jacobean Christian environment on the writings of William Shakespeare. At the conclusion, I will be announcing a new Zoom series on the Christian literary imagination, commentary and controversy, which we plan to start in autumn the fall. These series are part of a larger project, The Future of the Humanities, which is promoted and supported by the Las Casas Institute for Human Dignity at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford, and by Georgetown University in conjunction with Georgetown's Humanities Initiative. The aim of the project is to explore through a series of high profile lectures, talks, conferences, seminars, and symposia, the place of the humanities in continuing to develop an understanding of human life, dignity, equality, and culture. Among the distinguished lectures are ones by philosopher and literary critic, Professor Terry Eagleton, art historian and director of the National Gallery in London, Dr. Gabrielle Finaldi, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gerard, and by Dr. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury and current Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge. These are available on YouTube. YouTube. Ones in the pipeline for next year, depending on COVID-19's permission, are ones by the internationally renowned historian, Professor Dermot McCulloch on Thomas Cromwell, and equally world-renowned art historian, Professor Martin Kemp on Leonardo da Vinci. So to today's speaker. John Dukakis is Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Stirling, Scotland, and an honorary fellow at Wrexham Glyndwr University in Wales, and a fellow of the British Shakespeare Association. He's also a fellow of the English Association. He was one of a group of Shakespearean critics who in the 1980s and 1990s changed the face of Shakespearean criticism, the means and the methodologies of our approach towards Shakespeare's work. His 1985 edition of the Alternative Shakespeare's volume in the sadly now late Terry Hawke's new accent series brought together 13 essays by incisive cultural materialist critics who challenged the ideological basis of historical and predominant Shakespearean interpretation. John is general editor of the Routledge New Idiom, uh, Idiom series and is contributing editor to the revision of Geoffrey Buller's multi-volumed The Narrative and Dramatic Sources of Shakespeare. Professor Drakowski's edition of Arden III, The Merchant of Venice, through sound and detailed research, revises some traditional ideas about that play and critical views on it. I'm absolutely delighted that he's agreed to talk to us today. So over to you, John. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and uh, even more for this invitation to do something that I've never done before. Um, I'll get straight into my topic because I want to keep it as near to 20 minutes as I possibly can. 
Now, the debate about Shakespeare and religion has generally focused on identifying his religion and applying the results to his writings at a time when Christianity was itself in a state of flux. In 1597, uh, the ecclesiastical writer Richard Hooker distinguished between the activities of men fearing God and what he called a politic use of religion, between the internalization of the moral and ethical values authorized by God and the political use of religion for material purposes. He says, for a politic use of religion, they see there is, and by it they would also gather that religion itself is a mere politic device forged purposely to serve for that use. Men fearing God are thereby a great deal more effectually than by positive laws restrained from doing evil, inasmuch as those laws have no farther power than over our outward actions only. Whereas unto men's inward cogitations, unto the privy intents and motions of their hearts, religion serveth for a bridle. Now for Hooker, religion was the source of truth but it could also signify the fraudulence of godless men when, he says, they would show themselves politic devisers able to create God in man by art. Now, Fulk Greville's A Treatise on Religion internalizes this dialectic in a starker post-lapsarian view. He says, religion we by consequence confess here to be mixed of base thoughts and sublime, of native evil, supernatural good, truth born of God and error of our blood. Now both invoke a materialist account of religion only to dismiss it. On the public stage, at the margins, there appeared a figure for whom truth itself really was a matter of ideology. That figure was Marlowe's Machiavell, the prologue of the Jew of Malta. He says, and let them know that I am Machiavell and weigh not men and therefore not men's words. Admired I am of those that hate me most, Though some speak openly against my books, yet will they read me and thereby attain to Peter's chair. And when they cast me off, are poisoned by my climbing followers. I count religion but a childish toy and hold there is no sin but ignorance. Now in his discourses, Machiavelli recounts the case of the Roman Senator Numa, who, quote, finding the people ferocious and desiring to reduce them to civic obedience by means of the arts of peace, turned to religion as the instrument necessary above all others for the maintenance of a civilized state. Now, neither the prince nor the discourses were ever published in Shakespeare's lifetime, but the message of Marlowe's Machiavel reverberated through late Elizabethan culture and beyond. Indeed, in another play, Edward II, Marlowe makes the point even more succinctly. The imprisoned King Edward is stripped of his power by Queen Isabel and ambitious Mortimer. His mood alternates between soaring up to heaven to plainly to the gods against them both, unquote, and acknowledging the stark reality of his situation. But what are kings when regiment is gone, but perfect shadows in a sunshine day? Here, the efficient exercise of military power produces and sustains materially the image and authority of the king as son or as god. The boundary between politics and faith, maintained from the outset by Hooker and Fort Greville, is exposed and rendered porous in Marlowe, and I want to argue, in Shakespeare's second tetralogy and his Venetian plays. Now in Richard II, as in Marlowe's Edward II, the issue is the authorized monarch's fitness to rule. By exposing the political investment of Shakespeare's second tetralogy in, uh, in religion, Jonathan Dolomore and Alan Sinfield effectively rewrite the metaphysical assumption that lay behind E. M. W. Tilliard's concept of the Elizabethan world picture. They observe that, quote, this metaphysical vision has its political uses, especially when aiding the process of subjection by encouraging renunciation of the material world and a disregard of its social aspects, such that oppression is experienced as a fate rather than an alterable condition." Unquote. I want to argue that following the deposition abdication of Richard II in Shakespeare's play, the remaining three plays in the Tetralogy gradually expose the effic efficacy of religion as a political instrument while at the same time encouraging the internalization of political anxieties and uncertainties as the fear of God. 
The issue is brought to a head in Richard II before the ambiguous deposition scene, where Bolingbroke is offered the crown by the Duke of York. He couches his intended usurpation in explicitly religious language. In God's name, I'll, uh, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. In God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Now, we've already seen Richard's actual demise at Flint Castle earlier in Act 3, Scene 3, and we've heard the colic comments of the gardeners in Act 3, Scene 4. The material transfer of power, however, also involves the appropriation of a discourse that attempts to authorise and legitimise usurpation. But the fear that usurpation generates is articulated in primarily religious terms. The Bishop of Carlisle begins by asking a juridical question. What subject can give sentence on his king? And he proceeds to define the offence and to invoke divine retribution. O oh, forfended God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous black obscene obscene a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks, stirred up by God thus boldly for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king. And if you crown him, let me prophesy, the blood of English shall manure the ground and future ages groan for this foul act. Now Richard is an anointed king who behaves badly, but at the same time his authority is underwritten by divine imperative. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. Now this appeal is ideological, since a hundred lines later historical reality surfaces. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, or murdered. Now the contradictions that this collision reveals exposes the fragility of religion as an ideological weapon in that it fails to occlude actual historical reality. Now the remaining three plays in the Tetralogy attempt to heal the fissure that deposition usurpation has produced. Bolingbroke's reign begins in uncertainty since the new king has domestic and territorial problems. He has an unthrifty son, and later in the scene, he's forced to use force to exterminate his political opponents. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them if I once know where. All of this, of course, chafes against the teleology of the Second Tetralogy and that fantasy that, with hindsight, we call the Tudor myth. King Henry's response to Exton's news of the manner of Richard's death further exposes the contradictory position in which the new king finds himself. They love not poison, that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdered. Resultant guilt fuels the three further plays in the Tetralogy and culminates in a complex critique of another popular fantasy, Henry V as the perfect king. Now, one and two, Henry IV tease out the consequences of usurpation and the Machiavellian strategies required to maintain power. From the very beginning, the profligate pr uh, Prince Howe has a plan to use Falstaff, that old white bearded Satan, and his associates to engineer his own reformation. And we see how he gradually produces the fantasy of the perfect king who can refurbish and revitalize the political religious discourse tarnished by his father's usurpation. Indeed, Henry V's military and domestic exploits in France are given a religious makeover, while the marriage to Catherine at the end of the play exposes the prospect of future dynastic weakness and political disruption. Shakespeare took over the historical narrative from Hollinshed's Chronicles and also from Hall's Chronicle, in which the reign of Henry V is prefaced by an observation that echoes Hooker. How, remembering all that, sorry, that all goodness cometh of God, and that all worldly things and humane acts be more weaker and poorer than the celestial powers and heavenly rewards, determined to begin with something pleasant and acceptable to God. Wherefore, he first commanded the clergy sincerely and truly to preach the word of God 
and Lou after the same, so that they, to their temporality, might be the lanterns of light and mirrors of virtue. Here, the clergy are the instruments of political control, and this is taken up further in Henry V. Hal's transformation is framed in biblical terms as a miraculous return of the prodigal son, but he's also the Pauline Adam who combines transgression and redemption in one. It's the archbishops of Ely and Canterbury themselves who offer this description, but they're enmeshed in a political struggle to prevent a law proposing the confiscation of their lands. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession, for all the temporal lands which men devote by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, being valued thus. They're enmeshed in politics and are as Machiavellian as the monarch they serve. Now the new king is eager to secure ecclesiastical authority for his war against France. He's concerned to erase the memory of Henry IV's accession, although it remains a nervous tick throughout until the Battle of Agincourt. In the second scene of the play, Westmoreland and Exeter focus on political strategy. They fear that if France and Scotland were to combine forces, it would weaken political control. For government, though high and low, put into uh, parts, doth keep in one consent, congreeing in full and natural close like music. Now musical harmony and government are portrayed here as natural, and it's heaven that is responsible for stabilizing the social order. The state of man in diverse functions, setting endeavor in continual motion, to which is fixed as an aim or but obedience. But of course, we've already seen how that continual motion is stimulated by force and a shared political strategy to protect the king from, the new, uh, from adversaries and secure ecclesiastical land for the church. Here, power and influence are exercised through repressive and ideological institutions that can be relied upon to disseminate obedience and maintain authority. Religion becomes the glue that guarantees obedience and order, but it exposes the ideological function that faith fulfills in representing both as natural. Now, before leaving Henry V, I want to focus on a crucial exchange between the disguised king and his two subjects, Bates and Williams, that take place before the Battle of Agincourt. Here, Henry reveals something about his role as sovereign that implicitly undermines his own role. In this exchange, Henry in disguise presents himself as but a man stripped of his ceremonies, who is essentially no different from his subjects. His ceremonies, he says, laid by in his nakedness, he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with the like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason, no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he by showing it should dishearten his army. The subject Williams emphasizes the king's responsibilities and tries to absolve himself from some of the anxieties and the effects they generate. Henry's convoluted response to Williams' uh, Williams's nice juridical distinction is a clearly Protestant one, in that the subject cannot entirely absolve himself of responsibility. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore should every soldier in the wars do as every man in his bed, wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death to him is advantage, or not dying, the time was blessedly lost, wherein such preparation was gained. And in him that escapes, it were not sin to think that making God so free an offer, he let him outlive that day to see his greatness and to teach others how they should prepare. Now behind the anxiety communicated by this convoluted prose is always the deeper fear of divine retribution for the usurpation of Richard's crown. Moreover, the attempt to minimize the distinction between sovereign and subject is here no more than a political strategy designed to excuse or even diminish the king's monarchical obligations. We're all in it together, as we are now told. Indeed, as Henry tries to demean the ritual trappings of sovereignty 
and therefore to undermine their institutional significance, so he produces a romantic picture of the carefree life of the subject, whose identity alternates between wretched slave and free agent. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night the child of hell, but like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus and all night sleeps in Elysium. Now this is clearly not the experience of Bates or Williams, but later in the scene, the source of Henry's real anxiety is exposed. Oh, not today, think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. Henry's at it again after the victory at Agincourt, disclaiming responsibility for what we know was a concerted military strategy. Oh God, thy arm was here and not to us, but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. On a superficial level, the play reaches an orthodox teleological conclusion, but the chorus reminds the audience of its provisional nature. Henry VI in infant bands crowned King of France and England did this king succeed, whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed, which oft our stage has shown, and for their sake, in your fair minds, let this acceptance take. Now what's explicit in the second tetralogy, where teleological design itself comes under scrutiny, is less obviously the case in Shakespeare's two Venetian plays. In The Merchant of Venice and Othello, the focus is on a republic that according to popular imagination had the reputation of being hospitable to strangers and to mercantile activity. Both plays in different ways recall the ethos of Marlowe's The Jew of Malta. The Merchant of Venice pulls together two plots, one romantic and the other venal, both dealing in different ways with money and its circulation. Money itself, a topic with distinct religious overtones, is embedded in a political network that includes questions of authority, legitimacy and value. The play's anti-Semitism is articulated as part of a religious discourse and it's crystallized in the resurrection of a medieval fantasy figure the usurious Jew, a traditional enemy of Christianity. The Jew Shylock provides the means whereby money circulates in Venice, and it's important to recognize that the name Shylock, as the very autumn editor Howard Furness observed in 1888, is an English name. The practice of usury was conducted largely by English providers and was carefully regulated in England. The invective against the usurer derives much of its malicious energy from a religious hostility that in Shakespeare's play and beyond is the discursive register of an intolerant racism. The matter is complicated in this play because the villain is given an opportunity to elicit sympathy for his behavior. Now alongside the multifaceted myth of the Jew, there's another much more complex issue that Max Weber in his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism sought to address. He observed that Protestants, quote, both as ruling classes and as ruled, both as majority and minority, have shown a special tendency to develop economic rationalism, which cannot be observed to the same extent amongst Catholics, either in one situation or in the other. For Weber, uh, Weber I should say, the principal explanation for this difference must be sought in the permanent intrinsic character of their religious beliefs and not only in their temporary external historical political situations. Now I want to argue here that the reverse is true and that the historical political situations, the material situations such as trade and the demands of venture capital, as they are represented in the Merchant of Venice, provide the stimuli for the contortions that were necessary to guarantee the Venetian economy. The play invites us to gloss over some of the details of the Portia Bassanio romantic plot, which despite the fact that it's driven by patriarchal constraint, involves a project to replenish the coffers of a profligate lord. Shylock's merry sport is counterbalanced by Antonio's persistent suspicion of the outsider who usurps biblical authority to justify his actions. An evil soul producing a holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek 
a goodly apple rotten at the heart, or what goodly outside falsehood hath. Now this is one of a number of examples of a process of religiously generated stereotyping, complicated when Shylock makes his appeal to a common humanity. His imitation of Christian behaviour starts plausibly enough, but suddenly turns as he proposes to imitate Christian revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge! The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. So Shylock's behaviour is shaped by Christian example, thereby exposing himself as a hybrid subject. That division is deepened when after the trial scene, the Jew is forced to convert to Christianity and to become the Christian patriarch to what would otherwise be an erring daughter. If in this place sadness is an unexplained debility that afflicts Christian Venetian merchants and potentially wayward daughters, what becomes Shylock's illness has its roots in Venice's proprietorial anxieties. He says, you take my house when you do take the prop that doth sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. Now Shakespeare allows us to feel the situation of the outsider, even though, as the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard has observed, this kind of representation of the figure of the Jew is an Orientalist creation, a projection of Venice's own fantasies. He suggests that such representations effectively confront Western Christian culture with its own discomforting limitations because the Jew functions as a resistant excess that always escapes representation. In The Merchant of Venice, the most extreme conversion that takes place is that of Shylock, but there are of course others, from bachelor to married man, from virgin to wife, and in the case of Lancelot, from house, one household to another all of which are underwritten by the communal and or theatrical reaffirmation, reaffirmation of social rituals. Or to put it in Machiavellian terms, the application of institutionalized religion becomes a necessary means of reinforcing patriarchal authority, in one case from beyond the grave, in the control of women, and in the conversion of outsiders, all in the service of transfer of wealth from one generation to the next. At the end of the play, it's one of the main beneficiaries, Lorenzo, who arrogantly remystifies what has happened. Venice and Belmont have wandered in the wilderness, having negotiated the threat from the outsider and the perils attended on international trade. But money comes as a gift from heavenly angels. Fair ladies, you do drop manna in the way of starved people. But of course, in reality, the bread that Lorenzo thinks has been miraculously dropped from above is delivered courtesy of Portia's legal ingenuity and Venice's patriarchal juridical system. Antonio is a benefit, uh, beneficiary of these institutions and of a beneficent nature that brings his Argosies home safely. Now the Merchant of Venice forms a diptych with Othello in which some of the elements of the earlier play are reprised and reconfigured. Whereas we see in the earlier play the emergence of a gradual split in Shylock's subjectivity, in The Stranger Othello it's there from the start, and it informs the hero's unusual suicide at the end of the play. Iago's initial scurrilous account of Othello is that he's an old black ram who is tupping your white you. But this is not the only evaluation on offer, as the Duke indicates. Valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. The hybrid identity of Shylock in the earlier play becomes in Othello a tragically divided eponymous subject who does what in the case of the earlier plays Morocco is actually forbidden. The extreme and irreparable division is articulated from the outset, first by Iago, then by Brabantio, but of course it's also acknowledged by Desdemona. She says, my heart subdued, even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honours and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. Now these radically, two radically opposed views expose a tension between appearance and the inner man, and this is projected onto the figure of the external enemy, the Turk, who is represented as the subhuman, anti-Christian, animalistic barbarity that threatens Venice. Iago, 
and Otsio Brabantio is the internal manifestation of this force, driven by an unusually detailed fantasy life, supported by Venetian prejudices such as envy and a fear of patriarchal loss of control and frustration. But it's Othello who is ultimately persuaded to submit himself to this deadly combination. The audience is constantly being invited to judge the veracity of information critically, and whereas Othello's public statements appear transparent, his black appearance suggests the opposite. Indeed, the theatrical impression that Othello makes is always in tension throughout the play with what Daniel Vitkus has identified as the stereotype of the devilish Moor or the cruel Turk that was sometimes employed to demonstrate the supposed iniquity of Islam and to portray Muslims as agents of Satan. Now, this is also the dilemma in an open republic such as Venice where the instability is not just political or religious, but in this case, personal and psychological. If the incorporation of Shylock into Christian Venice uh, as a Brabantio avant la lettre postpones catastrophe and results in an uneasy comedy, in the case of Othello, we see what happens in its tragic aftermath, when the outsider or the stranger is entrusted with the defense of the state. In the second tetralogy, religious discourse is an ideological weapon used to support authority. In the Venetian plays, it exposes the political and psychological flaws at the heart of the Republic. Thank you. So I can't hear you, Mike. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, <laughs> for that, uh, that erudite, erudite, uh lecture i really enjoyed that um i wonder if i could start off i hope people will be putting in more questions uh, as we go along but you talk of a minefield of debate surrounding the different sects of christianity do you think that the arguments of the doctrinal as well as the political reformation provided a minefield of thematic conflict possibilities exploited by shakespeare not only in the plays that you've discussed but also in others, such as Macbeth or Hamlet? The short answer to that is yes. <laughs> but I think one would want to, to, to complicate this. Um, I don't think we think of Shakespeare, or at least I don't, think of Shakespeare as a doctrinal writer. Um, I don't think he's arguing particular doctrinal points. Um, I think certain issues arise in the plays that we can perhaps trace back to debates in uh, Elizabethan society. I mean, uh, in a play like Hamlet, for example, there is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. You know, we can trace through the idea of how providence operates and how different views of providence appear in um, the various doctrinal debates. Um, in Macbeth, you know, we can think about uh, the identity of the weird sisters and we might want to link that for example uh, to uh, something uh, that James says uh, in I think either um, the um, Basilican Doron or, or demonology where he talks about uh, you know sort of these superstitious figures as being the product of, of, of Satan itself. Um, we might take something like um, King Lear where Cordelia's speech at the very beginning, you know, you have, what, what do you have to say, says, uh, uh, says Leah? Nothing, my lord. Um, now, we could trace that back to uh, the um, sort of preferable forms of speech uh, in, um, uh, say, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I mean, these things occur. Um, and I imagine that they were things that an audience or audiences, particularly in the public theatre, would be able to connect with. But I think if we try to read um, a Shakespeare play as a kind of um, covert doctrinal, um, uh, you know, sort of um, exposition, then we would miss an awful lot. It comes in bits and pieces, is what I'm saying. Um, and, you know, we can extend it, you know, it would, a lot of work has been done on something like Measure for Measure. Um, 
you know, uh, and, and, and uh, the whole question of, of hypocrisy and judgment and justice and mercy, etc. It's there in, um, uh, in, in The Merchant of Venice too. And we can pick these things out. It's very, very difficult to try to project ourselves, of course, into the 16th century. Um, Thanks, John. I'll go on to another question because questions are coming in here now. And uh, uh, this is Fernando Gomez of the University of London. Firstly, uh, political theology, i.e. talk of God, is another word for ideology. Is that fair? Um, yes, I would think so. Um, the term political theology, of course, is, is um, uh, what's his name, Carl Schmitt, basically. He's got a, a little book on political theology. Um, it's a use of religion. And I think the reason why I raise Machiavelli is because Machiavelli is aware of the ideological power of religion. Elsewhere in the discourses, for example, he says, if you want to conquer a people, the first thing you do is you impose your religion on them. And the question is, why do you do that? Because of course your religion contains all of your values. We have a secular version of that. I've just been listening to our illustrious prime minister uh, putting forward an argument for global Britain um, and, you know, sort of complaining that the money that's given to poor countries, um, you know, may not be uh, spent properly and therefore we need to have more control. It sounds like a secular argument. It's a quasi-religious argument, you know, I mean. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. I just uh, just think, uh, I think it's Herodotus, doesn't he? He says, uh, if you want to uh, undermine the, uh, the Republic, you first, you first of all attack the language. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, it's another, I mean, language, of course, is deeply ideological. I mean, ideology is, is tied up in it in, in, in all sorts of ways. And it's, it's very, very complex. So does that answer your question, Fernando? <laughs> well, I hope so. I'll come. We'll have to. We'll have to see. I can't. I can't tell that. <laughs> Fernando had a number. I might come back to Fernando if I can. But I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm trying to be honest to. Uh, uh, to every. Uh, Margaret Bushell had a question. She said, um, uh, "You talked about Machiavelli not being published during uh, Marlowe and Shakespeare's lifetime. So uh, how was uh, how was that being published? How did they get? How did they get to know about Machiavelli? Well, they didn't need to read Machiavelli." Um, I mean, there were people coming back, and Marlowe may have read him. Uh, Marlowe made a lot of trips to the continent. Um, I mean, if you if 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 you read P. F. Gent's Contra Machiavel, uh, which was published in 1602, you could reconstruct Machiavelli from the very long discussion um, that. Uh, PF, I don't know who PF was, um, uh, produces. Um, there's also, of course, and I don't know the date of this, so if anybody can tell me, uh, William Fowler, a Scot, who did a Scots translation of The Prince. Now, I don't know how that was circulated. I only know of it in manuscript. Um, I don't think it was published until the 19th century. But I presume that he wrote it not just for his own edification, but to circulate amongst people. Um, well, John, you're the man in Scotland, so maybe <laughs> maybe you'll come back to, to us on that at one point. Catherine Temple says, uh, as a scholar of, of Enlightenment law, I see many connections between natural law and music, particularly in the idealization of harmonic balance and its connection to the divine. Do you think there's a shift between Shakespeare's time and say the mid 18th century that saw harmonic ideals shift in application from the crown to the law? Oh God, <laughs> my blind spot I'm afraid is, is, is classical music. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, I can only answer half of, half of that. I mean, I do, I do think that notions of harmony um you know are again as indeed notions of aesthetics are always carry an ideological charge um you know how you define harmony um 
and or, or indeed how you define the link between different elements uh, of, of, of music. Um, beyond that, I'm not prepared to go because, uh, as I say, I think you would need somebody who has a classical training in the criticism of, uh, uh, of, of, of music to be able to do okay, that. Okay, John, I'm going to go on to, uh, to uh, John Hirsch, who's a professor in, uh, in Georgetown, and he says, uh, brilliant reading, thank you so much. But is there not also in Henry V an element of communal brotherhood, whether among soldiers or Christians or both, that carries with it ecclesiastical overtones and implies duties to others as well as to God, duties that effectively define the Christian, elevate him or her to an ennobled state available only through action. Mm. It's a difficult question because all of the statements or all of the, 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 the statements that are implied in, in, in the question um, are also accompanied by um, sort of violations of order one way or another. You know, there's Scroop and, and that group that, uh, uh, that, that uh, are persuaded to expose themselves. I mean, I think that this is how Henry V has come down to us, as it were, as, uh, you know, some kind of uh, statement of brotherhood. And this is how, of course, uh, Laurence Olivier's film of 1944 tries to persuade, um, you know, his audiences that this is what the play is about. I think the play is much more critical than that. I think the play is critical of the relationship between authority and the subject. Um, it exposes religion as an ideological weapon by exposing the institution, the church as an institution. You know, the archbishops at the beginning, in that large um, account of uh, Henry, the, Henry V's um, reasons for uh, wanting to go to France, uh, it's the church that underwrites this. And the church underwrites this, I'm talking about the institution of the church underwrites this because of course they have a vested interest. They too want to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. They don't want their lands taken from them. That's the reality of the situation. And I mean, what you have here are tensions rather than expressions of, uh, you know, brotherhood or, 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 or whatever. I mean, I think that's the ideology. The dominant ideology is one that would certainly, um, you know, like, like to well imply that but the reality if one looks closely at the text one finds fissures of all kinds there um and i don't think then one can uh you know what one one can extract that kind of meaning from the text without of course all of the other stuff in other words you have to brush this against the grain as well there's 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 an ideology but also you get the alternative as it were or you get an undermining of that ideology, which is okay. why the play is so apologetic. Okay, let me turn to uh, Sam Miller. He, he says, recent interpretations of Othello interpret Othello as an outwardly assimilated Muslim in a Christian society following Jay Broughton's exploration of the play and the early modern resonances of Moore. How does seeing Othello as a Muslim affect your argument? Um, doesn't affect my argument at all. Um, in fact, it rather, I think, substantiates it. Othello has within him a figure called the Turk. Depends on how you interpret that figure. Um, I mean, he's not a doctrinal Muslim or anything like that. He is an outsider. He combines, if you like, the noble Venetian on the one hand, and of course, the marginalized Turk. In fact, he goes to fight the Turk, okay? And what happens is that he realizes that the Turk is inside himself. This curious kind of split between, you know, nobility on the one hand and post-lapsarian, shall we say, evil on the, on the other hand, is what's absolutely central to this play. 
And basically what we've got here is in fact two stereotypes. I mean, it's no accident that this play is set in Venice. It's no accident that it deals with the outsider, largely because, of course, Venice was noted for being a republic that actually welcomed outsiders. In the two Venetian plays that Shakespeare writes, he concentrates on two figures, one of whom is forced to become an insider, which causes problems, and the other kills himself because he is forced to enact a justice on the Turk in him. This is why the, the um, you know, why, why the suicide at the end of the play is so perplexing. What Othello does is to externalize this suicide. You know, I mean, you contrast this with Hamlet, where, you know, Hamlet's concerned about the prospect of suicide, that, you know, the Almighty has forbidden it. This is nothing to do with that at all. You know, this is, if you like, one stereotype seeking to eliminate another. Thank you. Um, Paulina asks, on the subject of Othello, would Bianca's sta status as a non-Venetian inform her treatment by Cassio and others, or does it have more to do with her prostitution? <laughs> Persuade me that Bianca's a prostitute. That's my first question. Um, the thing is, Bianca, in a play that, that plays off against black and white, Bianca is white, right? It's only when Cassio is talking to Iago that he thinks of her as a customer. And we know what Iago is capable of doing. I mean, Iago literally turns things around. Um, you know, he, he, lit, he undermines every kind of discourse. Um, and it's only everybody who comes into contact with him. You know, Rodrigo, Brabantio, Cassio, and then finally Othello, okay? Now, in a play where black and white played off here, we're left in doubt as to what Bianca actually represents, as we are left in doubt right the way throughout the play. Okay? I mean, the play starts in the middle of a conversation, so we don't quite know what the conversation is about. We then have this whole business of where the Turks are. So there's a lot of information. And the Duke is the only character in this play who seems to be able to judge accurately. He won't do anything until he's sure, right? Whereas all of the other characters we come up against, we have to make a judgment about them and we're never given a sort of uh, a definitive explanation of who they are or what they are. And Bianca is one of those characters. And I think if we, if we, if we look at the logic uh, of, of, the, of the play, then we can see that um, we can't take even Cassio's word for what Bianca is. Um, is Bianca a Cypriot? Well, I don't know. She appears in Cyprus, but this is not a realistic play. I mean, this is, if you like, an imaginative geography. She has no character. She says she's an honest woman. Okay. What okay, can we say? That's a, um... <laughs> Let me go to another one. Uh, sorry. Uh, Catherine Taylor, with regard to the uh, dichotomy of authority in the law, do you see a sense of strain, especially in Henry V, between the holy state of anointed king and the evident assertion of the subject's own duty to his conscience? I'm thinking of the Lutheran stress on obedience to the monarch and Tyndale's comment that the people had set up three wrong kings in a row after deposing Richard II in the 1520s. Tyndale was thinking of that as, as a wrong that had consequences. Yeah, um, I mean, you know more about Tyndale than I do. Um, but I mean, I think generally speaking, that's probably right. But I come back to the tension that I 
put, you know, try, try to um, draw attention to in, in my talk, that there's a gap between the ideology that says, you know, you must be obedient to the monarch because he's God's deputy and the kind of historical reality, which is really to do with, shall we say, um, tensions within what I suppose we might want to call a class fraction. I mean, it's, uh, these are tensions within the aristocracy. And what they do basically is they, they maneuver against each other. They engage in assassination. Um, remember, most of these are not popular revolts. You know, uh, I mean, right the way throughout the tetralogies, and I'm think, thinking particularly of the Cade um, rebellion in, in Henry the Sixth. Uh, you know, that's not something that's um, uh, that's approved of. I mean, this is we're, we're looking basically at an aristocracy which are jockeying for power. Um, I mean, the real issue in Shakespeare, and the real issue that Shakespeare deals with, is, you know, first of all, those who are dissatisfied with Richard throw their lot in with Henry IV, then they become disillusioned, and they then become rebels. And there is this tension that's maintained throughout. In other words, the ideology, if it ever existed in reality, doesn't work. And what we get, I think, particularly in, 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 in the later Shakespeare, is statements about the divine right of kings placed in the mouths of villains. I mean, the, the obvious one is uh, Claudius in Hamlet. There is a divinity that doth hedge the king around, that treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. Well, if that had been the case, Old Hamlet would never have been killed, and we would have had an Elizabethan one-act play. We'd have had no play, effectively. So, you know, the, po the point is, we have to be very careful about these statements and about the context that we provide for them, okay? Okay, thanks, John. I'm going to ask you one last question. This comes from, uh, from uh, Professor Mike Collins at uh, Georgetown. Why do you think uh, Lorenzo uses an allusion from the Hebrew Bible to articulate or announce the occurrence of the conventional miracle of the romantic comedy? <laughs> Why do I think? <laughs> well, let's, let, let's look at that whole beginning of that scene. You'll have to be brief, John, because we're going to lean out of time. Okay, let's look at the, the, the beginning of that scene where uh, both uh, Lorenzo and Jessica invoke all kinds of examples. Um, I think that Lorenzo really, uh, the, it's, put in, it's put into his mouth because of course, as I suggest, the mystification of what happens is important here. Um, I mean, it's usually uh, thought that at the end of the play, Antonio is left on his own. No, 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 no. Antonio is paired with his money, right? And of course, he is the benef beneficiary of, shall we say, providence in inverted commas. Of course, he's also the beneficiary of, you know, Portia's um, uh, sort of performance uh, in, in, in the Venetian court. And when you look at, when you look at the detail of this, you, you ask questions about, well, you know, this is the way in which it's expressed, but that's not the reality. And I think that, you know, in both the Venetian plays, what we are looking at is a critique of the Venetian Republic, something that Elizabethans were particularly interested in and they were particularly worried about. You know, we think of Venice as the flesh pots and all the rest of it. That's only one version. There's another version, right? A much more dangerous version. It's a version where all hierarchy collapses. And basically, of course, what uh, the play does is to investigate how that hierarchy is constructed. And it's not very complimentary. So I would say it's ironical, at the very least. <laughs> okay, John, I'm going to uh, start to draw it to a close there. And um, can I thank you very much for answering those, uh, those questions. Some of them were uh, really, uh, really taxing questions. And uh, you, thank, you, 
you answered them incredibly well. And thank you also for such an exciting paper. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I can tell from the questions that have come in, and I'm afraid we didn't, uh, weren't able to ask all the questions. So they'll land on your desk at, or on your laptop at some point or, or, or another in the next week oh, or so. And I'll do what I can. If you can answer. I'll, I'll do what I can. Okay. Yep. Can I thank everybody who has submitted questions today and who have been with us today as well? Can I thank all at Georgetown University who have made this happen, especially Ivan Quek uh, and colleagues making, uh, making Zoom possible? Special thanks to Professor Catherine Temple for her work behind the scenes in feeding the questions to me. Mike Collins uh, just uh, asked the last question, and can I send him our congratulations? He's a great Georgetown Shakespearean, and he gave his last, uh, his last lectures this week and retires in a few weeks' time. So good luck to you, Mike, and, uh, and may, may everything go well for you. My thanks as ever to Paul Edmondson um, for his uh, support of this series and to my joint coordinator, Dr. Yvette Cowery of Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Thanks to, to other Blackfriars Hall, Hall colleagues, Dr. Richard Finn, the director of the Las Casas Institute, Dr. David Goodill, the acting regent, Dr. Claire Broom Saunders, the senior tutor, and King Arona Gabnay, our UK administrator. At Georgetown, my thanks to Dr. Jack DeJoy, the president, Dr. Tom Banchoff, the vice president of global affairs, Dr. Chris Chalenza, dean of the Georgetown College. And finally, my thanks to everyone here who's been receiving this. Uh, 179 people today. I think we started off with about 30. So that's been fantastic. And, and I hope you're going to join us again. This is, of course, the last in the current series of Christian Shakespeare question mark. But we are in discussion with the university press that is very interested in publishing the papers as a book. And we hope to inform you all about that in due course when we come to actual publication. Please make a note to join me again for the introductory session of our new Zoom series, The Christian Literary Imagination, Commentary and Controversy. This will be at the same time, four o'clock BST, 11 a.m. EST, on Tuesday the 31st of October. We're lining up an array of some very fine international scholars for the series, including the return of John Dukakis, speaking on Turner's The Atheist Tragedy, Paul Edmondson talking on Shakespeare, Michael Collins talking on either T.S. Eliot or Jane Manny Hopkins, and many more. They will present a series of talks looking at a different writer, work, or literary critical approach to the overall concept each fortnight. And we aim to discover what we interpret or presume or question by the term, the Christian literary imagination. In the meantime, have a good summer as possible in these difficult, difficult times. But I hope everyone keeps safe and takes care. I'm Mike Scott. Please follow my predominantly Shakespeare Twitter at Mike Scott Prof, or contact me at michael.scott at bflyfriars.ox.ac.uk or through the Office of the Vice President Global Affairs at Georgetown University. Thanks again to John Dukakis for a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for making it a wonderful afternoon by joining us here uh, through Zoom. Goodbye.